right, I have the dubious distinction as being between the only thing between you and lunch. Um, all right, so I'm going to briefly uh, discuss aortic dissection as fast as I can for you. So uh, again, definition. So acute, uh, the subject is diagnosed within two weeks of symptom onset. Chronic, after two weeks, uh, there's a subacute uh, within three months kind of period that some people write about. Uh, complicated or uncomplicated. So complicated means they have evidence of malperfusion, uh, refractory hypertension, rupture or impending rupture, and then the kind of gray zone area is the patient with uncontrollable pain. So uh, we can have a type A dissection, we can have a type B dissection. Two-thirds of them are type A, uh, a third are type B. Uh, again, Stanford and DeBakey uh, classifications, uh, Stanford proximal, uh, B is distal. Uh, DeBakey came up with uh, type 1 dissection, which is essentially from the ascending aorta all the way down. That's the most common type. Uh, isolated is type 2, where it's just involving the ascending. Uh, both of those are surgical emergencies in the vast majority of cases. Uh, those patients need an operation. Uh, for the type Bs, there's 3A and 3B for DeBakey, above the diaphragm, below the diaphragm, A and B. Uh, mechanisms of malperfusion. So uh, when we figure out why these patients are not getting end organ perfusion, it can be from a dynamic or a static problem. So dynamic means that the uh, flap of the dissection is ball valving in and closing over the origin of the vessel that's uh, needing to be perfused, uh, the screen there on the left. A static obstruction means that not only is it flapping over, but the dissection now goes into the vessel origins there, and it can either cause a stenosis or a complete occlusion with thrombus formation that you see there at the other far picture. Um, the importance of all that is a dynam dynamic obstruction. You treat that by increasing pressure and flow into the true lumen versus a static obstruction where not only do you need to do that, you've also now got to deal with the vessel origins and either stent or clean that out or do something to it. All right, so anatomic features. So a type A dissection typically begins two centimeters above the right coronary cusp, curves around the arch and goes down. The type Bs typically begin just at or distal to the left subclavian artery. In general, for a type B dissection, the celiac SMA and right renal come off of the true lumen, the left renal comes off of the false. Not always the case. Uh, dissections frequently go down the left uh, as opposed to the right. Um, vast majority of these patients, uh, especially in the older age, they're going to have uh, poorly controlled arterial hypertension. Uh, if you have it involving patients that are much younger, uh, start thinking about uh, cocaine, meth, other drug use, make sure you check all that stuff, um, or connective tissue issues. Uh, most patients that have a type B dissection, they're very hypertensive on presentation versus a type A dissection. Uh, frequently, they're hypotensive. So if they haven't had imaging yet and you're trying to figure that out in the ED or somebody's trying to figure that out, um, that's kind of an easy way to do that. Uh, they can have strokes for a type A dissection. Five to 10% of patients uh, have that. Uh, they also present sometimes with leg ischemia. That's when you'll be called. Uh, and then again with oliguria or anuria if the uh, renals are involved. Um, sudden death uh, can be the presenting uh, feature in either a type A or type B if they rupture. Uh, the type A, there's other causes too. They can shear off the coronaries and it looks like a uh, acute myocardial infarction. Uh, they can also have severe AI. Uh, they can have tamponade just from a uh, fusion. Um, and a lot of times if we have a type A patient that comes in that has significant uh, pericardial tamponade, you open up their chest, you suck out their fluid, they're not actually freely ruptured, uh, and their hemodynamics improve significantly. Um, signs and symptoms, again, severe sudden chest or back pain. Uh, if it goes into the abdomen, whenever I see a dissection patient, that's something I'm really worried about. That's an ominous sign. You're worried about mesenteric ischemia. Uh, those patients tend to not do well. Uh, there's a lot of debate going on now. If you have a patient with a type A dissection that comes in with uh, predominantly abdominal pain, elevated lactate, uh, you look at their true lumen, it's really small. Do you do the type A first? Uh, do you mess with the descending thoracic aorta? The group at Emory has uh, uh, got some good data that maybe we ought to be dealing with the descending thoracic aorta first in those patients, and then uh, if they're doing well in 24 to 48 hours, go in and fix the type A. Uh, hypertension, again, vast majority of these patients uh, in the descending thoracic aorta are hypertensive. Uh, less common in the ascending aorta, they can be hypotensive. Syncope can be caused from tamponade, uh, from carotid dissection, uh, or if they're paralyzed. 
Uh, again, your uh, imaging studies to diagnose all this stuff, chest x-ray, uh, most of these patients are going to get a contrast CT scan before they call you. Uh, again, echo is very good. The common situation sometimes that we see where the imaging is a little uh, dicey of what you're going to do next is the patient comes in with abdominal pain, they get an abdominal pelvic CT, they find a dissection, they've already got a contrast load, you go back and image the um, thoracic aorta because what you're trying to figure out is this a type A dissection that went all the way down or is it isolated to the descending because totally different management. So a lot of those patients, especially if their kidney function is not very good, uh, we would take them to the operating room, do a transesophageal echo, got a good look at the ascending or decide if it's a type A or not. If it's not, pull the probe out, take the patient to the ICU, control their blood pressure, and then re-image them in 24 to 48 hours. Uh, if it is a type A, then you know what you need to do. Uh, again, chest x-ray, widened mediastinal uh, shadow, uh, cardiomegaly. Uh, again, echo is very good. Uh, transthoracic, less so than transesophageal when looking at the aorta. And you can see the flap on echo. Again, CT scan is the most common thing that you're going to see with. MRI is good for follow-up, not really good for acutely um, uh, dealing with these patients. Uh, again, the imaging studies, for the most part, the sensitivity and specificity is very high for all of them. Uh, D-dimer uh, in the emergency room may be another good thing to help sort out, uh, you know, PE, those types of things when you're trying to diagnose these patients, trying to figure out if it's a dissection, if it's a PE, if it's acute MI, or if it's just musculoskeletal stuff. So what's the treatment for a type A dissection? For the most part, uh, it's a hemi-arch repair uh, with an open distal anastomosis. So when we do cardiac surgery for dissections, um, some people... Uh, incorrectly uh, will put a clamp on the ascending aorta that really limits the amount that you can resect. You're having to leave dissected uh, thin aorta where you're trying to sew against a clamp. The aorta is all kind of mushed together. You can see there in that third picture. The better thing to do for those patients is to do circulatory arrest, either with retrograde cerebral perfusion or anti-grade cerebral perfusion, and then do an open distal anastomosis, shut the pump off, clamp their anominate, have flow going up one or both carotids, and then cut that aorta all the way back from the anominate all the way to the underside of the left subclavian uh, and get a good running anastomosis with no clamps on. Uh, and that's less torque, much safer to do uh, than trying to do it against a clamped anastomosis where you're going to end up with a half-ass operation. Um, if they have a problem, and then most of the time uh, you can either reconstruct the aortic root with felt uh, or it doesn't go all the way down into the root or involve the valve. Uh, that's why echo in these patients is so important beforehand to see if they've got uh, aortic insufficiency. If they do and it involves the valve, sometimes we can repair it and resuspend the valve. Uh, we put felt down there in the, the sinuses. If it's not, then you're just going to replace the valve and do what's called a bentol procedure. So bentol is basically a mechanical or a, a, a pericardial prosthetic valve sewn into a graft, and you basically sew that down to the annulus and then re-implant the right and the left corners. Uh, again, type A is 1% per hour uh, emergency. Uh, in general, across the U.S., it's somewhere between a 20 to 30% mortality rate still. Uh, and a lot of it de depends upon what vessels are involved. If the coronaries are involved, if the uh, brachiocephalic vessels are involved, your mortality increases significantly. Uh, another option uh, for patients that uh, this is a, another thing that's going uh, across the country, people are starting to do more for type A's, is patients that, uh, uh, that have uh, just a hemi-arch repair, uh, 20 to 30 percent of those patients, if you follow that out over time, are going to get a big arch aneurysm and a redo operation and uh, difficulty with that. So one of the things that uh, at least I just, I just finished my cardiac fellowship at Penn, and one of the things we were doing for acute type A's and young patients that were otherwise uh, healthy is that we would debranch the innominate, the left carotid, so just in front of the subclavian, avoid the recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, do whatever you need to do proximally, called the zone two hybrid arch, and then you can go in and T-bar, and now your whole arch is taken care of, and they won't end up with a second operation. You can even do a branch TBE graft into the subclavian. Uh, so that's something that um, people are going to start doing more and more, being aggressive with uh, the arch involving type A's. Uh, for type B's, again, the majority of these patients, it's going to be uh, anti-impulse therapy, medical control in the ICU, unless there's malperfusion or a complication like we talked about earlier. Frequent imaging, we would get the initial CT scan in the emergency room, maybe one at uh, 72 hours, 
and then another one, if that looks stable, at three months, six months, 12 months. Many of these patients are gonna degenerate, and most frequently, it's the very proximal descending thoracic aorta that's gonna dilate up first. Um, and so you definitely have to follow these patients. Uh, indications for intervention for type B dissection, again, would be uncontrolled pain, hypertension, bleeding, malperfusion, or an increase in size, or if they start out very big. Uh, there's some data that may be starting out greater than 41, 42 millimeters uh, for a total aortic diameter, true and false, or a false lumen greater than 21, 22. Uh, those patients are going to be predisposed to aneurysmally degenerating that proximal aorta, and maybe you ought to do about something about that beforehand. Uh, the risk of paraplegia, again, in the historical series for type B dissection where you're so into tissue paper, really high, 20 percent uh, mortality rate, uh, 30 to 50 percent uh, for acute type Bs, replacing those acutely. Um, very low for T-bar, uh, somewhere less than 5 percent or so. Uh, again, we talked about kind of dynamic and uh, static obstructions. Um, the old-fashioned way of doing what's called a fenestration, so uh, before you would bypass grafts or do open things, they would actually open up the aorta. This is from Mel Williams at Hopkins. Basically, you'd open up the aorta after you clamped it. You'd cut the septum out. Uh, you'd tack the vessel origins back, uh, and then you'd reshape the aorta back over a dilator and make it smaller. And he had these series of these patients that actually did really well uh, in terms of late degeneration didn't happen to that uh, segment that they replaced and had a big old long running suture line with felt all the way along. Uh, this is a case of mine where I had a lady that uh, uh, had an infrarenal dissection that went into both renals. Uh, I tried and tried and tried to uh, get across the septum to stent things back, couldn't do it. She was making new year, and I said, screw it, let's just go to the operating room, or let's just open her abdomen there in the hybrid room. And I ended up um, uh, super celiac clamping her, opening her up above the renals after exposing things from a transperitoneal approach, cutting all that out, tacking back her renals, and then closing the two sides of the aorta with felt. And within five minutes, she started peeing on the table, and it was awesome. Um, creatinine went from, you know, on the verge of needing dialysis to four days later, she's got a normal creatinine. So don't forget about the old-fashioned operations. The endovascular fenestration where you're popping across with uh, uh, Pioneer, some of the other catheters, um, uh, and then ballooning the crap out of the septum. All of that stuff you rip and tear sometimes goes somewhere. I've seen where big flaps have flopped down and occluded iliacs and stuff. So it's not as easy as it seems sometimes. Uh, in the chronic phase, uh, depending upon the series, 30 to 40 percent of these patients that have a type B dissection are going to go on to develop uh, aneurysmal degeneration and get a thoracoabdominal aneurysm, and uh, they end up getting a big open repair. Uh, the, the ones that are at the higher risk of uh, degeneration are actually ones that have partial false lumen thrombosis, and uh, there's a good New England paper where they actually went in there and measured pressure gradients in the true lumen, the false lumen, and there's an elevated end diastolic pressure in those that had partial thrombosis over time, and they think maybe that's why those patients do worse as opposed to somebody that their entire false lumen had flow in it. Uh, but the partial thrombosis falls, folks, where this flow is going into the false lumen and down into a blind-ended sac have uh, worse uh, uh, risk of degenerating and becoming aneurysms. Um, I'll skip that slide. Uh, most patients uh, these days for type B aortic dissection uh, are getting a complication-specific tailored treatment. Uh, again, medical therapy in the ICU, beta blockers. Um, and then if those patients have uh, a complication or they have evidence of um, uh, significant growth or risk factors for growth, then they may, uh, you know, get a T-bar. And so things have really started to increase with that. Again, initial medical therapy. Uh, ideally, you want your blood pressure maybe to 100 to 120 systolic. Your pulse maybe around 60. All of that is tailored to the patient's urine output and their neurostatus. So I've seen where we've had patients that were really crazy hypertensive. You block them down to this level. They're aneuric. They're not making sense. They're somnolent. You just got to liberalize their blood pressure um, and just kind of roll with the punches there. Uh, again, the open repair for type B dissections in the old days really suck. 30% mortality. You're sewn to tissue paper. Avoid open operations for type Bs if you can. Uh, the instead, instead XL trials, this was looking at uncomplicated type B aortic dissection, and this is what's really pushed TVAR for these patients. Uh, the initial uh, studies were all done in European centers. You can see the numbers there. They published the two-year results, and there was really no significant difference when you looked at um, 
uh, mortality, aneurysm-related mortality, uh, freedom from progression from aortic disease. And basically, at that time period, people said, well, crap, we shouldn't be putting TVAR in for uncomplicated type Bs. Fortunately, they followed the patients out. Uh, because one of the things they found at two years is that remodeling was awesome. So maybe 90% of those patients uh, thrombose their false lumen, which ideally would be the goal for a type B dissection that you're treating with a T-bar. You want to get that whole thing to thrombose. You want it to heal back together and shrink in size. So when they followed the patients out uh, at five years, they found uh, the ones that had optimal medical therapy only, um, they may have done really decent at the very beginning, a uh, year, two years out, but then it's that year three, four, five, uh, and beyond that they start having aortic-related complications and mortality. Uh, the folks that are treated with TVAR, for the most part, those folks, uh, if they're going to have a problem, it could be related to that procedure. Uh, and there are mortalities and retrograde dissections and stroke and things like that that happen up front, but there really weren't mid and late aortic related mortality issues. And so uh, based upon that data, a lot of people have been uh, becoming more aggressive with TVAR for type B dissections. And the, the question really is, which ones should we watch medically? Which ones should we treat? And a lot of that really depends upon uh, risk factors. Again, that 42 greater uh, total aortic false and true lumen uh, 22 millimeter false lumen or greater. Um, we're still trying to figure a lot of that stuff out. The, the other question is timing. Do you do it uh, at that same admission, uh, maybe a week or two later? Do you do it in the chronic phase? Because in the chronic phase, that septum becomes very thick. It doesn't move. Uh, much harder to treat those patients with a T-VAR and get a good seal and to get the thing to thrombose. And so the sweet spot may be somewhere between two weeks and three months of treating those patients. Um, you're going to find out in your practice that a lot of these patients, they suck at taking medicines, they suck at follow-up, and uh, they're not somebody that um, is going to follow up with uh, imaging studies afterwards, and it's just a tough group of folks to treat. So again, it's a relatively rare uh, pathology, has grave consequences. Medical therapy works, uh, at least initially, uh, and should be the treatment of choice for uncomplicated dissections in the majority of patients, although again, that is changing as people are finding out uh, that there may be some risk factors that we can identify that uh, predispose people to uh, having aneurysmal degeneration. It'd be easier to treat them up front than it would later on down in the chronic phase of things. Uh, endovascular repair is uh, much easier to do than open repair uh, for acute type B dissections. Um, you're, the ones that you're going to operate on in the acute setting are folks that have static or dynamic obstruction. Understand those mechanisms. And uh, open surgical repair, again, remains a, a valid option in the chronic phase of things. Thanks, guys. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs> Questions? I have a question. Um, is there, what's the importance of distinguishing a type A from a type B that extends proximally to the ascending aorta? So a retrograde type B? Yeah. So it all depends upon your entry tear. So ideally, if we have a patient that comes in with a type A, um, most of the time the tear is going to be a couple centimeters above the STJ there. Um, if we do a type A dissection, we open up the ascending aorta and there's no tear there, uh, what we worry about is that the entry tear started distally and retrograde dissected back. And in those patients, you're more aggressive about doing something with the arch. So debranching the head vessels and putting a T-bar in to seal that distal entry tear. If you leave the entry tear alone, for sure, those are patients that their descending thoracic aorta is going to, although you may prevent the cardioembolic and cardio um, rupture risk by doing the ascending repair in a hemiarch, uh, their descending thoracic aorta is going to dilate up and they're going to end up with a, a thoracic or thoracoabdominal aneurysm down the road. And so in those patients, we're more aggressive about doing something with the arch when we don't find something in the ascending. We'll T-bar those patients and debranch the head vessels. And there's lots of different ways you can do that. All right, let's go eat. Thanks, guys.